Let's do a show. Sure. Why not? Mm. Finish doing. Sorry, I got okay. very excited because I got a cinnamon bun. That was what was cri- crisping, but I'm just going to... Oh. <laughs> cinnamon buns are the best. Yeah, get yourself a husband who gives you cinnamon buns before recording. Well, maybe not right before recording. So that's bits of it. <laughs> I'll take yours, <laughs> thank you. And I meant your husband, not your cinnamon bun. <laughs> Fair enough. Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of Because Language, a show about linguistics, the science of language. My name is Daniel Midgley. Let's meet the team. He didn't get his linguistics knowledge from any fancy pants university. He learned about it in the gutter with all of us. It's Ben Ainsley. The university of life, mate. That's where I've been educated. Now there's an <laughs> accent that has some attitudes with it. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Hmm. Very much. As I've just heard that phrase. I can't even remember what film or television show that's from, but I distinctly remember that exact phrase being delivered probably in a much better version of that accent. Was it Michael <laughs> Caine? It sounds like you were doing Michael Caine. Yeah, oh. or... Um, if it was, I apologise on behalf of Michael Caine and everyone else. Mitchell and Webb. Yeah, maybe Mitchell and Webb. That sounds like a Mitchell and Webb thing. Mm. Mm. Anyway, you should do Hedwig's one now. I'm sure it's much better. She did learn linguistics at a fancy pants university. I did. But she hasn't let that keep her from wearing other forms of clothing besides pants. It's Hedvig Hurgard. <laughs> I thought it was going somewhere different. I thought you were going to go, but that doesn't keep her from rolling around in the gutter with the rest of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She wears different clothing in the gutter and elsewhere. Hmm. Yeah, no, I do. I am actually wearing fancy pants today. I'm wearing some Are lovely you? pants that I bought in Canberra that have a sort of kangaroo pocket. Do you know what? I'm wearing some fancy pants right now too, some pajama pants. So I feel like Hedvig and I should both mm-hmm. send pictures of our pants to add to the show notes page. <laughs> okay, oh, yeah, I sure. will too. Sure, I'll do that. I will that. also do my pants. Yeah. Hang on, getting a getting a Daniel, pants Daniel, selfie. Daniel, Daniel, stop! I, no, no, I feel I'm... like you're pantsless, and we really need to stop here. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> there we go. You'll see what kind of pants I'm wearing. Oh, that it makes it worse. <laughs> that definitely didn't improve my <laughs> suspicions. I, I'm not specifying. Okay. You should definitely in, in, introduce the third and f- most mm-hmm. important member. We have a very special guest joining us for this bonus Patreon episode. It's the host of the surpassingly popular Allusionist podcast. It's Helen Zaltzman. Helen, hello. Hello. I'm sorry that I did not wear special pants for this. I'm wearing a dress. That is zero pants. Dresses are lovely to wear, though. Yes. Dresses are great. Does it have pockets? No, because I made it and I didn't want to make pockets. <laughs> My broad understanding of pants could be sort of extended to anything that covers the lower half of the body. Oh, okay. Well, I'm wearing uh, oh. a, a dress pants. I'm a very permissive uh, definitionist. Yeah, very. I okay. think that they need to have one entrance and two exits. Hmm. Oh, mm. interesting. Mm. Well, some of us are clearly prescriptivists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think pants need to have a separator between the legs. I'm I'm basically a dictator. Yes. Mm, okay. I'm glad we're on the same page. Moving on. Yeah. I'm wearing the British form of pants, which is the underkind. Mm, yes. Ah, yes. yes. Of course, the, the British. British. Pants. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I didn't really expect to go here this quickly in the show, but I will <laughs> say this. Something strange happened, Helen. On this very day, mm-hmm. an old high school chum emailed me out of the blue. Um, because this is what you have to do to reach me, since I can my Facebook account. She emailed me. We hadn't heard from each other in years. And the very first thing she wrote was, hey, there's this podcast. Maybe you've heard it before. It's The Illusionist, Helen oh. Zaltzman. She's really smart and funny. <laughs> oh, no. Also, she, yeah, she's she's like going on about this. And, and uh, she says, also, she does this Veronica Mars podcast that I really like, even though you mm-hmm. might not. And then- Wow. I love Veronica Mars. I was trying to find a way to say that you were on the show with us tonight without it sounding like a total flex, you know, oh, yeah, I totally know Helen, nails emoji. You should have said, oh, that asshole. no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> with that uh-huh. amateur podcast. That's some real Truman Show vibes there that someone brought up, yeah. I've done Truman Show. Um, <laughs> wait, got what, out. What? hang on. Oh, right, I th- I, you were doing a bit. I was just like, wait, is that a code for something that I don't understand? What's doing a Truman Show? I want to know about this. To me, Truman Show is like when you when you think about something and then like the radio plays a song you're thinking about. Yeah, or you start seeing ads for stuff. 
like when when things seem to be like your life seems to be choreographed and like produced. Mm. I'm trying to think of a witty portmanteau of déjà vu and Truman Show for, to to encapsulate that moment. But Truman, I'm Truman, up Truman, yeah. Truman, 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 déjà vu man show. Yeah, déjà true. Deja Deja true. Deja true. Deja true. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, she is on the far more successful <laughs> linguistics podcast. Well, it's also just <laughs> earlier in the day where I am. I have an advantage because, uh, you know, you're not as tired. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to lean on that gimme that you've just offered me and say, <laughs> yes, that's definitely it. <laughs> so basically everybody in the world, Helen, knows you're awesome. But in case there's oh. someone who doesn't, could you please just give us a quick rundown of all the stuff you're, you're doing? Uh, well, yeah, I make three podcasts predominantly. Uh, the Illusionist, which is an entertainment show about language, and Answer Me This, where we answer questions from the audience upon a great range of topics, and then Veronica Mars Investigations, where we're recapping the television show Veronica Mars, uh, and we've nearly finished. So that, wow. there it is. There it all is. I just finished my first um, look through of Veronica Mars uh, Sans the movie uh, just a few weeks ago, so it's still all very raw. Fresh. Uh, yes, mm-hmm. it, it sort of starts mm-hmm. stronger than it ends. Mm. I've never tried it myself, but I'm a huge fan of The Good Place. And so now I have been oh. sort of uh, cautiously mm. interested in going back and seeing some of her earlier work. She's amazing in it, but it's a very different show. Yeah, it's not that similar. I like The Good Place. I like Veronica Mars, but it's not that similar. But it does seem to be a trend I've noticed among boys that I'm interested in. So my ex and my bo- husband are both like Veronica Mars stans. Interesting. Um, yeah, I think I think if you meet a boy and he says he likes Veronica Mars, apparently maybe that's a good sign. I don't know because hmm. it's it's a show with fairly terrible gender politics and a lot of sexual violence. So maybe not. Yes. Yes. To be fair, the way the thing you've just described is unfortunately applies to like eighty five percent of all media being made. <laughs> like it's so sad that that isn't a very exclusionary metric for like a <laughs> lot of things that are on television. Yeah. Oh. It's maybe a little bit different for Veronica Mars because the male writers, I'm, 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 you, Helen, obviously know a lot more about this, but I just watched it and this is my understanding. The male writers want to make Veronica the kind of feminist that they think women should be. One who hates other women. And who often exactly hates other women, but then they, they need to make it so she still likes her super valley girl friend who passes away and she has some other very feminine type friends but her best friend is mac who's also very tomboy and not like other girls in general veronica mars is not, not like other girls yeah. Right. um mm. yeah that is i agree and it comes off very often as very uh, like a male writer has done this <laughs> I'm thinking of watching the good place again and they say that the first time you watch it as eleanor the second time you watch it as janet Oh, that's Mm. interesting. I like that. That's a good Mm. take. Mm. Not mine. This is a special bonus episode for our wonderful patrons. If you're listening to this Mm. reasonably soon after its release, thank you for being a patron. You are helping us to do stuff like transcripts, and you're making it possible for us to do mail-outs and keep the show going and do the work we love to do. If you're listening to this quite a bit later, because we released it into the wild a few months afterwards, then thank you as well for listening. And if you want to join the movement... If you want to hear bonus episodes the moment they come out and hang with us on our Discord channel, head over to Patreon and support the show. And while you're there, Helen, are you on? I am. The Illusionist has a Patreon. Ah, great. Go to the Illusionist Patreon and support Helen as well. And if you are a Patreon right now, help me because I need help with my quiz questions. I need quiz questions, (laughs) please. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Shall we get to some questions? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Mm. Wait, do we want to do the news first? Don't we have a little news thing? We're just jumping straight in. Okay. Jumping in. No words of the week either. Oh, wow. Yeah. This is, this is, this is oh. exciting. Oh, shoot. This one comes from Tio Frio on Twitter at Beegemeister. We've seen them a few times. Are there any languages that use the raspberry sound as a phoneme? If not, why do you think that is? Well, oh. how do we start? Because you'd be spitting everywhere? <laughs> straight to the right answer. Well, what is the raspberry sound? Let's start there. Is it is it that? <laughs> it is that. Okay. Do you need to push your lips against something or not? Your tongue. Your tongue. No, no, no. Do you need to do like towards your something or can you go? No, that's optional. That's just for flair. That's optional. In that case, I would argue, which I argued with Daniel before the show, that this is essentially what is known as a bilabial trill. 
No, 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 no. Hang on. <laughs> Hang on. We need to define what this is. This is the, using okay. a bilabial trill like brr or brr. The first one was pulmonary brr, and the second one was uh, ejective. That's not a raspberry. Okay. And then make a raspberry. To do a raspberry, you <laughs> must put your tongue out. You have to put your tongue out like that. Okay. But when you do it towards like, like I just did towards my arm, I don't put my tongue out. In fact, when no, I no, do no. it on like little baby's stomachs, I don't put my tongue out. Uh, okay. So no, no, no. Hedvig brings up a good point here because yeah, yeah, you yeah. can do a raspberry on someone, in yep. which case it does not involve the tongue between the lips because that would just be super fucking creepy. I know why that's yeah. not a speech sound. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I am also prepared here to back Daniel in that when doing it unassisted or what we like to call a blonde raspberry. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> interesting. So I just oh. made that up out of <laughs> virgin okay. raspberry. Yeah, virgin raspberry. Um, um, you, you've got to have your tongue between the two lips to make that sort of that trilling sound. And I would go one step even further, mm. which is to say a true aficionado of the raspberry will do it whilst vibrating both the top and the bottom lips simultaneously against this the tongue. This I agree with. Yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. Helen, would wow. you, would you, so even if they're like the prototypical non, uh, when you do a raspberry, not on a person. Mm-hmm. The blonde raspberry. An air raspberry. Do you agree that the prototypical one, like Daniel and Ben, has to have a, has to have a, a tongue element outside of the teeth? Wait, I'm going to have to try it now. I, I do, please excuse yeah. me. Okay, so. This mm-hmm. is, this with is good radio. <laughs> That's with tongue. This is without tongue. <laughs> <laughs> So I would count See, both of those similar. as raspberries. A, no, I, I disagree. They're, Thank they you. are clearly Thank different. You. Oh, no, they no, are as no, no, similar no, no, no. as M You introduced and our guest N. as a very important part of this show, and she's made a judgment call. Well, in my favor. I'm, I just think if you're if you're asking this question, you might as well cover the batonged raspberry and the tongueless raspberry, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, let's let's start with calling it what it is. So this could be defined that the the blonde raspberry <laughs> could be defined as a voiceless. Labiolingual trill. Sure. A voiceless labiolingual trill. Okay. Now, this doesn't appear on the IPA chart, which is why I think, no, there are no languages that use it as a speech sound. If we did find it in a language, we would add it. However, I do notice mm. that it appears on the... Well, they, that's what they did with the... with the. Uh, yeah, but the you, can, the you, can, you can probably add a bunch of little diacritics and get to one, maybe. Mm. Absolutely. Um, mm. I did find it somewhere, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, not on the IPA chart, but the ext IPA symbols for disordered oh. speech. This is a this is a thing. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. It uses a weird character that I've never seen before. It's the Roman numeral one thousand C D. That's the Unicode name, and what it looks like is imagine a C and then a D butted right up against each other. It looks like a butt, which is fitting. Because right. it makes a butt-like sound, right? Is it a bit like when you have an O and an E stuck together? But yeah, yeah, is... yeah. But it's two O's or a C mm-hmm. or a D. Yeah. Okay. That's so cool. let's 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 focus on that one for a second. Uh-huh. Why not use? I think Helen's answer is probably a really good one because you're just blowing saliva everywhere and it's gross. Not ideal. Is there not other speech sounds that do that though? Exactly. Oh. Uh, so I before the show I sent Daniel two examples of the the tongueless. Uh, voice by labial trill so yes. that's no tongue and it's voiced and you use both lips um, <laughs> one of them the first one is from a song by a tribe called quest called ham and eggs Yay. where he goes bridge yes um which i think really is a good example of by labial trill it's my favorite example the other one is um a recording of a language in vanuatu called aham and it has yeah it just has a more it's it's a more natural bilabial trill in the middle of a word. That is what a bilabial natural sound would sound like. Okay. Yes. And that was the word nose in Achamp using the bilabial trill, which is definitely a speech sound in lots and lots of languages. So how come nobody goes, hi, my name is Dan Pfjol? <laughs> um, is it because it's really hard to chain together with other phonemes? Like much harder than other phonemes? Because you have to kind of stop, do it, and then re- resume? Yeah, you could only really do it if your sounds right before and after are also in a similar position, which most other sounds aren't. 
That's a good point. I do find the difficulty is kind of in the mouth of the beholder, though. Maybe it w- are there certain phonemes that only ever sort of start a word in certain languages? Because I could see the raspberry yeah. being like pleasantly or something like that. You know what mm. I mean? Yeah. Mm. The spellable chill from a ham example is in the middle of a word. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm. Well. My guess here, we're always having some tension between putting effort in to make ourselves understood and then, you know, easing back if not so much effort is required. And I just feel like the sound takes a lot of effort. Of art- You're putting your articulators pretty far forward. I Look, I've got to be honest. I, as a not linguist with no experience in the field <laughs> in any way. Why start now? I, I find that hard to sort of buy into. And the only reason is... All fucking speech is hard. Like, mm, it mm. it takes human beings a really long time to figure out how to do it. And, like, heaps of trial and error. And to my, like, super Western Anglo-centric sort of brain, a bunch of the sort of um, non-English phonemes from places like um, Africa seem really, really hard and difficult to me. Mm. Um, but... I'm sure they're not. I'm, I'm sure they're not any harder or more difficult than any of the phonemes that I speak. And I know classically that, like, in Japanese, putting a P and an L next to each other for a Japanese person is like, the, what? Yeah. That's impossible. Whereas to me, it's just like, no, that's just the sound in purple. Like, it's just... Yeah. Um, so, mm. I don't know. I, I, I don't find that it's a bit tougher to do is necessarily that good a reason. I don't know. People are super lazy. I think probably <laughs> in in English anyway, you're just going to lazy it out and say put instead of because yeah, it, true. it is much That's less true. mouth effort. Do not underestimate how lazy people are. Well, we dropped the silent B off the end of things, so I mm. suppose you're right. Because there's a lot of things we can do with our mouths, but that we don't do. And not because they're so difficult, we can't even produce them with our mouths. We often can do that. We can do a lot of weird things with our mouth that we don't use in language all the time. But if you want to say a sentence, you want to say a sound and then another sound and then another sound, there Mm. are things that don't really meet that threshold of, like um, Ben was saying from the start, that maybe don't go that well together. And um, like Helen was saying, you know, you you can't underestimate how lazy you need to be in order for that to be a quick processing thing that you can do in milliseconds. So uh, what you're kind of talking about here is the like, blank tiles in the IPA chart, right? Some of Mm -hmm. them because we can't literally pronounce those sounds, but other ones because we kind of could, but they're just stupid and dumb and really hard. And so they've just never made their way into language. Would the raspberry sound just be that? Like, would it be potentially like a bit of a blank tile in the IPA chart? There's not even a place in usually the IPA chart for the lingual stuff, is there? Not labiolingual. No, there's no labiolingual column. There's labiodental, which is your lip to your teeth. But what's about? F and v. I got one more. We've we've heard a number of hypotheses: the uh, living saliva loca theory, <laughs> the too much effort theory. Um, could it be that it just sounds taboo? Like it sounds oh, like a fart. Yes. Farts are, farts are pretty no. universal. Nobody wants to. Ma- nobody wants to sound like that. Nobody wants to hear that. I actually no. think this this one I buy the most. Really? Why? Yep. T- taboo hypothesis. Taboo avoidance, it's normal. Yeah. We, we know it exists. Right. So my, when I fart, it makes other sounds as well. Some of them sound like other language sure. sounds. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the, 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 the words people say for a dog barking all over the world are different, right? Um, mm-hmm. But like, I don't know. I reckon you could go to just about any culture in the world. and People love the fart sound. Y- exactly. You could go to any culture in the world and say in that person's language, hey, 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 what does this sound like? <laughs> And I am pretty sure every culture in the world in their language would be like, that sounds like you farting. I think if it was that taboo, people wouldn't be blowing raspberries on babies for fun. Uh, Yes. Yes. (laughs) And people do find fart sounds really funny. So I think that's partly because it's like, ooh, but like they're not a particularly outre uh, forbidden sound, are they? Just just to throw it out there, because I just want to throw good money after bad now, um, do we perhaps think that we sanction the uh, blowing of raspberries on babies because babies are one of the only areas where those kind of body functions are not seen as particularly taboo because we have to deal with them all the time? Mm. No, I think it's just because uh, the baby's not verbal yet. 
So uh, <laughs> fair enough. Yeah, you, okay. you can use the uh, phonemes you're not otherwise using. Makes True. no odds. And and at the end of the day, it's really hard not to blow a raspberry on a on an infant's yeah. tum tum because it's yeah. just so satisfying. Yeah, I try and blow them on my cats. It's That's, a limited success. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that, that sounds unsuccessful Difficult and dangerous <laughs> simultaneously. Inadvisable. Unless you've got one of those furless cats. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. What? Blowing a raspberry on a sphinx that, that you've just, <laughs> wow, you can't gouge out your mind's eye, Helen. If you have one of those cats and you can blow a raspberry, please send us what it sounds like. like. Why would you do that? Don't. Why would you not do that? No. That's like a person who has an aversion to feet and I then you're just it. going, hey, can we anyone want send me like pictures of your stanky feet? Like, no. <laughs> Don't okay. do that. I can probably do a raspberry on cement. I'll try. Oh, what's the next theory? Hang on. I did. Oh, uh, that's the only three. Um, oh, okay. I got saliva everywhere. I like how I like how Hedvig sounds disappointed. Like Daniel, I expected <laughs> you to come up with more theories. No, no, no. I um, like it. These are fair. Yeah. Saliva everywhere, too hard to make, and sounds taboo. I didn't want to do this, but I'm making a Twitter poll right now. Oh God! And we're going to come uh, back to it at the end. Okay. Wow. Okay. There we go. Next one. This one comes from James on Patreon. I just looked up the origins of confab on Etim Online because you're always going on about it. Mm-hmm. And then through to confabulation. And from there to asterisk BHA, ba, as a root. Okay. Now that means to speak. That's what it was in Proto Indo European. Mm-hmm. James continues. However, it seems. Most of the words connected to ba, I am familiar with, have become more like fo from Greek, finan, which also means to speak. The broader mm-hmm. question is, how can phonetics change so much from a bilabial voiced plosive, b, to a bilabial unvoiced fricative, f? Are there examples like this in more recent memory where we can observe perhaps in the last hundred years in other languages or maybe English as a nod to the language of the show? Totally love you guys. Keep up the awesome work, etc. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Uh, thank you for sending us those kisses at the end, James. Uh, Helen, Daniel, and Hedvig, can you please explain every aspect of this question to me? Because I don't understand. Well, I'm not a trained well, linguist. I'm out. Uh, <laughs> okay. D- Daniel and Hedvig, can you please explain to Helen and I? <laughs> One of the things to keep in mind about what we're talking about here is that we have three kinds of sort of evidence. We have modern languages and the sounds they have. Cool. We have records of ancient languages, like ancient Greek, where we think we know what ancient Greek sounded like. Cool. And then we have reconstructed languages. Now, reconstructed languages rely on the first two. And when you do reconstruction in historical linguistics, you try and find the solution to, to the two you have and what things you have uh, in the languages, you find try and find the solution that uh, is the most parsimonious, the Occam's razor, that is the simplest. But also, historical linguists employ specific... Uh, they have certain ideas that certain sounds are more likely to change into other sounds. Okay. So they'll say, oh, it's more likely that an S goes to a H than a H goes to an S, or something like that. Like so, we we see this with like um is it like D and T H as well like um I yes. for some reason in my brain like yeah, Peda right. and father are like cognates and that sort of thing right yeah those kind of things or dental going to teeth you know right yeah so so there are a lot of these but it means that there are certain sounds for example that are just very rare to occur in ancient languages do you see my point okay. yes. Because they are supposed to be in these chains, right? So if you go backwards, you just sort of go one way. Um, right. I don't know if... Uh, so I was hoping that if I gave you that overview and context that Daniel maybe had looked up the things about the specific route. Is that true? Okay. I, I want to approach it from a slightly different direction. So James is asking, if you have B, it, like a stop, that's called a plosive because it, it explodes, B. And then later on, you've got F for those words, how did that happen? And it's actually, it actually has kind of an easy answer. It happens all the time. It's got a name. It's called lenition. And the word lenition just means weakening. And that's where um, Ben was talking about. Sorry, which, what was your example, Ben? Was that um, father pater? and pater? Yeah, you got pater going to father. So there's a p, a nice plosive going to f. Uh, it also happens with cornus, which in English appears as horn the the 
k goes to a h. It also happens in Polynesian with s to h. Savai'i becomes Hawaii. Ah, very good. I noticed that mater, mother, in Latin goes to mother, so the t in the middle goes to a the. And in fact, in French, it goes to mère. It's it's disappeared entirely, and that's Lenishan too. Yeah, and it's、uh, so because we've seen this pattern over and over again with ancient languages and modern languages. We've built up this idea that there are these specific rules that, like, s goes more often to h than h goes to s, or p goes to f more often than f goes to p. But the truth is also that we actually haven't done historical linguistics on that many languages, really. If we if we're just honest with ourselves, so some of these rules might also be a bit. Wrong. So, when you see a reconstructed root, there's a reason why they mark them out with an asterisk at the front. It's because you should take the precise、uh, phonetics probably with a grain of salt. It's it's probably more likely to say there's some sort of word that is the ancestor of these words, and it maybe was somewhere along these lines. But maybe the precise phonetics you should sort of、um, be a bit careful with. We're kind of to the end of my expertise on this, but. Could it possibly be a cycle where things start out with stops and then they they Ooh, weaken that's a fun concept. all the way down, and then they sort of we, we sort of start putting stops in again? I know we're talking about very long、yeah. timescales. I've heard people suggest that that、um, if you because if, if you just go on this lenition path, for example, sooner or later you'll just end up with a morpheme that's just like a vowel. Uh, right,、yeah. like、ugh. everything disappears.、Um, yeah. So there is this theory that you add on, maybe not content in the same place, maybe not even in the same morpheme slot or phoneme slot, but that you might be adding on content somewhere else in the word or morpheme to bulk、mm. up the phonetic distinctiveness. Because as、mm. you go down this lenition path, you end up at, you guessed it, Danish. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, and、uh, as we've done never, the show on, never fail to rely on a speed. <laughs> just having、booty. a good old swing at the Danes, I love it. Well, we had a whole show on it, so I feel entitled to do it. <laughs>、um, but、uh, but there's this idea that maybe maybe you don't make the s that went to a h become an s again, but maybe you add an s somewhere else in the word. You do something. Yeah, you you probably need to do something because otherwise, all of the languages that exist today would sort of be like, uh, 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 uh. and they're not. To be fair,、so. I think you could also criticize the like a broad Australian accent for just being ridiculously vowely with not a lot of consonants. Just like, oh yeah, man, how you going? <laughs> and then that's that tension between you know like efficiency or what some people call laziness, and <laughs> yeah, I call it efficiency. And you know the drive to be understood, the, which is after all what we're kind of doing around here. We should probably point out also that fortition, the opposite of lenition,、uh, fortition is strengthening. That happens too.、Uh, that's how, for example, burthen and murther became burden and murder. Sometimes sounds do strengthen. But the important part is that that doesn't necessitate that it's the same phoneme that gets strengthened. It's probably somewhere yeah, else、right. in the word. You can、yeah. just do some crazy other shit in another place. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's lenition. Thanks, James, for that question. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Sorry, I just had kiss, to send it back.、Kiss. It seemed rude not to. You, you don't have to reciprocate. It's okay. For the record, James wrote X X X. I feel like、yeah. I need to say、yeah. that. That's what. But kiss, kiss, those, kiss is. Those are kisses. I know. I'm just saying、okay. that if you wrote kiss, 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 K I S S, that would be a different vibe. That's true. That okay, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair、true. enough. Okay. They want to make it weird. The fidelity you, of James's message has been heightened. Yeah, maybe it's like the three X's on a cartoon bottle of ale. Yes, perhaps yeah. poison. Yeah, maybe. Cass on Patreon says, "Am I burned out or burnt out, or do I just have burnout?" Ooh, I'm sorry, Cass. I would like you guys、yeah. to explain the difference between burned and burnt very much, because I didn't realize that I had that question until right this second. <laughs> We have smart patrons. No, I think we should ask you, Ben. What do you feel、oh, when you、oh, see the、no. word "burnt"? No, honestly, <laughs> because this this, this isn't a technical linguistics puzzle. This is a native、okay. speaker puzzle. You、All、need、right. to、um, put, close your eyes. Yep. Pull inside of yourself. Take a deep breath. <laughs> oh no! This is just like therapy, and I do really badly in that context. Ah,、uh, okay. And then、um, when I say when I say "burnt," what do you see? Well, I heard "ed" just then. Is that what you mean? Like、no, your voice. When I say、okay. burnt, what do you see? With a T.、Uh, With a T. <laughs> some. I okay. Um, I see a. Maybe this is just like my Australianness, but like I see a landscape that is 
black. Oh, interesting. And then、mm. we'll try it again. We'll take a deep、mm-hmm. breath. Yep. Oh, <laughs> just, just too much. Get on with it.、Um, I see a person who has sustained an injury that we call a burn.、Mm. Ah. Interesting. Okay. I don't know. I don't, did I pass the test? <laughs> this is just no, you did. Am I a good、you、person? <laughs> yes, you did. You said. You said what you saw. That's all you had to do. Oh, this is like therapy. Do you think one is more intentional? Uh, I think burned ed is more intentional. Like there has been、ah. more intent behind it. Yeah, okay. Ah, interesting.、Um, if I say the word toast, do you think burned or burnt? Burnt. Uh, burnt. Okay. But I burned the toast, and the toast is burnt. So、mm. burnt、yes. is more of a state、mm. of being, and burned is more of a a verb. Even though they are the same, aren't they? Like just burnt is older than burned. Okay, so burnt with a T is older, Helen. Is that、That's、what you're、right. saying? That's right. Yes. Okay. And also, we tend to use it as an adjective. So you have burnt toast, burnt brick, burnt offering. Those all have T's. The landscape is burnt. But if you say I burned, you could you could say either I burned the toast or I burnt I've I've burnt the toast. They're、yeah. they're both okay. Yeah. So for burnout, you might have burnout one word, but probably not burn out. Nouns get compounded. I would say that these days you're probably burned out. So I took a look in the Google Ngram corpus, and I found that "burned" and "burned out" are more popular than "burnt" or "burnt out" in American and British English. I th- I wonder though if that is purely a reflection of our writing habits not really mirroring our speech habits, because I、yeah. feel like I've heard people say "burnt out"、mm. far more often than I have heard people say "burned out." Well, I did do a little check on Youglish dot com, which allows you to look through the annotations in YouTube videos, and it looks like "burned out" and "burnt out" are about fifty fifty in spoken English, at least on YouTube videos. And as we discovered in our little breathing exercise earlier, when I said "burnt" the first time, Ben thought I said the other word, so they're excessively <laughs> similar. Yes, very,、yeah. very, very, very. Well, I think、yeah. that's probably why "burnt" with a T. Existed, and then the ed was to make it more regular with other past tenses when people were trying to even、yeah. up spelling.、Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, I think that's、okay. a good shout. Anyway, Cass, we hope that you're okay, that you're not too burnt out, and thanks a lot for that question. Let's go to Britta on Twitter. Okay, philosophy Twitter. Why are they called metaphysicians and not metaphysicists? Four、oh, question marks. Oh, because.、Oh. Uh, Physician, well, metaphysician is an older word than physicist. Metaphysicians from about fifteenth century, physicist from nineteenth century. Nice. Ah, I was going to have a totally different guess. Oh, oh I want to、yeah, say what my guess is because、oh, I, I feel like、it. human beings. Oh, I ruined the game. No, 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 no. No, this is good. No, no, no. You didn't ruin the game. I just fully expected that、uh, meta. Physical whatevers,、um, whichever <laughs> word we want to use,、um, chose physicians because far more authority and status is conferred with the position of a physician rather than a physicist. Even、oh. though a physicist is still a very high status profession, I feel like basically no one beats doctors in terms of them saying stuff and us going, "Yeah, okay, I'll do that." Well, that that's sort that of right because the person who coined physicist, as in a student of physics. Uh, was、um, a man called the Reverend William Whewell, possibly Whewell. It's spelled W H E W E L L, which、um, I know it's. I don't know how to do it. Do you?、Um, <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. He he published a book in 1840 called The Philosophy of the Inductive Sciences, and he said, "As we cannot use physician for a cultivator of physics, I have called him a physicist."、Um, we need very much a name to describe a cultivator of science in general. I should incline to call him a scientist. Thus, we might say, as an artist, as a musician, painter, or poet, a scientist is a mathematician, physicist, or naturalist. So this guy's on fire. Yeah,、wow, yeah, he is just dropping the heat. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. We will. <laughs> so many Ws. Yeah, I was going to say that naturalist must have been the earlier thing. Yes, it was.、Right? Uh... That's what like Aristotle thought he was. I couldn't believe this, but metaphysician has been in use since the mid fifteenth century. It was a growth industry then. Amazing, the Silicon Valley of its time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should tell our listeners because、uh, I totally know what is a metaphysicist. <laughs> well, a metaphysician. 
A metaphysicism. <laughs> Metaphysics is just like making up bullshit about supernatural bullshit. That's what it is. <laughs> okay, oh, let's go to Helen for a definition. Is next. it not a real thing? Well, an early definition of metaphysics from 1569 is things supernatural and the science of them. So I think it's just pin balanced angel counting. I believe there isn't there a non Christian kind of metaphysics as well? That's bullshit too. Okay. Wow, coming out strong. No, but anything supernatural, I don't care if it's Christian or not. Do you not have a spiritual bone in your body anymore? Have you not met uh, excommunicated religious people before? I was That's not true. excommunicated. I you know resigned. what I mean. Sorry, like um, <laughs> people who have turned away from their community, like like they go harder than any other group of atheists. Like I'm yeah, like a probably. casual atheist. I'm like, yeah, man, God isn't real, but like whatever, you do you. Whereas people from those religions are just like, no, evangelical atheists. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. I'll change my mind with any evidence of supernatural anything. Okay. But Daniel, this one time I put a crystal on my friend and then they got better. So Well, that's yeah. it. Okay. <laughs> got um, just got so metaphysics is yippee wah wah nonsense. Like just if we put just like a big line under it, is that fundamentally what we're talking about? Study of the supernatural. Yeah, it's it's no, but it's also the study of, of the world as it is. It's actually the way I learned about it for the first time, which I thought was how you're using it, is from Aristotle of like uh is answering questions like what is there and what is it like and what are objects and what is knowing and what is time. It's well, that sounds like philosophy. Yeah, I think it's philosophy. all questions, no answers. Okay. So is, is metaphysics just philosophy or is it different? I think it's a kind of philosophy. I, I just pulled up Wikipedia and it says it's a kind of philosophy. Yeah, the science of hmm. the inward and essential nature of things. But also science yeah. it, uh, itself didn't mean what we now use the term to mean until fairly recently i think i thought it just meant knowledge more generally for hundreds of years Mm. yeah this is why we need helen on the show more often because she teaches (laughs) us such wonderful things it's like the reading (laughs) rainbow of like cool etymologies now you know i just uh you know as a as an uh evangelical atheist for pedantry um (laughs) <laughs> now I just delight in, in telling people, you know, these things aren't concrete. It meant something else for ages. Don't get too possessive about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No science for sure. It's really hard to be like linguistics adjacent before you just almost like against your will have to adopt that idea. Like at a certain point, the amount of evidence about how fucking up in the air all of this shit is just on a long timeline. You're just like, oh, I can't really have a strong view on much now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real release in a way. It's sobering. Hmm. It seems to me that metaphysics had a lot of stuff, but bit by bit, people took it away and said, okay, we're carving this off and it's epistemology. Okay, we're carving that off and it's ontology. And pretty much all that was left was the supernatural because everything else became science. Uh, I think maybe this is this is a discussion about classification because as I'm reading about here, I think people use metaphysics as the umbrella category for ontology and epistemology. So, mm, okay. but, but I don't know. So not entirely supernatural. No. Okay. That's cool. I think the, the, the real test here would be call up like a sort of academic specializing in ontology and be like, do you describe yourself as a metaphysician? And if the answer is no, <laughs> then I think we have a fairly clear answer about who this word probably pertains to. Yeah. Twitter poll. But <laughs> for now, the answer to Britta's question, and it kind of was in the the tweet replies already, but metaphysician came first because they had access to the word physician, whereas physicist wouldn't be around for a long time, couldn't be used. That's a really cool piece of evidence, uh, Helen. Thank you for bringing it to the show. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. Couldn't come empty handed. <laughs> I got <laughs> that was awesome. shooting from the hit with etymology. Boo, boo. <laughs> Bill on Patreon says, hey, y'all love the pod. Keep up the good work. Can you help me find a non-ableist replacement for lame in my lexicon? I've been struggling with this myself, Bill. Yeah. Your replace a slur from your lexicon series is one of my favorite segments, and I haven't been able to figure this one out. You do a great service to me and my friends. I've heard people try to use pathetic as a replacement, but pathetic lacks the useful connotations that lame has. At least it has them here in North Carolina, USA. I think those useful connotations are something like pathetic because your social privilege separates you from reality. 
I've also described lame as evoking an idiot white suburban dad who thinks he's figured the world out because he had an easy life. I don't know, y'all. Mm. Maybe something like Karenish could work, but since I'm a white man, Karenish has sexist overtones. Boy, Bill, you are really exploring every angle mm. on this one. Listen, Bill, real talk, okay? Lame doesn't really mean any of the connotations that you have listed. I mean, what it really means is physical disability. Every other meaning it has is just the connotations of ableism, which means I don't think you'll find an exact synonym for what you think it means, and you won't find one term for all circumstances in which you would use this word. So think about what it is you're trying to say in each of these specific circumstances. Like sometimes people are being pathetic. Sometimes you just want to dismiss whatever they're saying without really specifying why. Sometimes they're being boring. Sometimes just rubbish, we would say in Britain. Uh, mm. Insipid, inadequate. I think that's an excellent point. Uh, I was also thinking that it's going to be really hard to find a perfect match. One that came to mind for me that might cover some of the use cases is basic. Um, <laughs> I think that yeah. it's it's not going to be... Listen, we can't we can sit here and list like some ideas for Bill, but we're never going to be able to find one perfect replacement. But um, I like the ones you were listening to, Helen. I think they were good. Parochial, maybe, for what he's describing as well. Parochial. Mm. That's mm. quite... Fancy. I've always um, favoured, because um, I've struggled with this a lot, um, I really like, in terms of, I'm going to try and answer in terms of the spirit of the question for Bill, like a like a, like a a good, um, versatile, non-ableist, non-homophobic, you know, all the, mm. all the various umbrella kind of thing. I really like wanker. <laughs> I wish Americans would get on board with wanker. I think they'd enjoy it so much. They don't really have those like mid-tier swears. It's just such a yeah. They don't have a masturbatory thing. I know. But what's Bollocks wrong with well. masturbating? I don't get it. No, n- nothing. And look, it, I guess, I guess, I, I, at worst, it's not particularly sex positive. But I've got to be honest. In the like, in the spectrum of people who probably need people looking out for them, people who masturbate are probably not on that list right now. Like maybe we'll get there one day, but um, unless we get to some, I don't know, bizarre handmaid's tale type future i think for now people who masturbate probably don't need their stuff protected as much as say people with a disability or like black people or whatever yeah no definitely Um, that (laughs) yeah i don't use this word and i'm never stuck for uh, a a criticism of somebody (laughs) i i don't know if this is helpful or not but i um recent lockdown and also end of my phd i find it sometimes a hard time to to express myself when I'm a little bit stressed or anxious. And I've come into this pattern of using very basic, very small sentences. Like, I don't feel well, period. I don't like this, period. Hmm. I want to go lie down now, period. I don't I <laughs> don't want to go to that thing. A simplistic like, <laughs> automaton, basically. <laughs> no, but but I but I like it. Like just it's it's again to go back to like therapy. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, okay. restating mm. things in the simplest of terms when it's like, yes. I don't like this thing. I don't like this person. I would like to not have to do anything with this person anymore. It's you like- basically become Hal <laughs> from 2001 as Dave is shutting him down. No, Dave, yeah, a little bit. don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, no, a little bit. I, I, I'm an advocate for this type of thing. And if you're really into this kind of thing, I recommend checking out natural semantic meta language, yeah. which is when people try and come up with definitions for words, maybe such as lame, using only about 60 to 70 basic words. Uh, and they'll be like, there is a thing the the person talking doesn't like the thing. That'll be like a description of something mm. like lame. I'm into it. I like this too. And my guide is when there's something you're trying to avoid saying, try to get to the bottom of what's you're really trying to say, because Always. the word you want is probably lurking in there waiting for you to find it. For example, um, let's just try this together. You put lame next to other words and it's different. So if, if there's a lame attempt, what are we really saying we don't like about it? That it's ineffectual. Basically. Yeah. Yep. Misguided. Pedestrian. Right. Okay, mm-hmm. good. How about a lame excuse? An ex- it's an excuse that is... Insincere. Inadequate. Not even trying. Yeah, transparent. Yeah. See, something like that. We can say that. Um, lame duck period, which is when oh, that's a leader... Oh, the thing, yep. A leader has been voted out, but the new person hasn't come in yet. Oh. Um, that, that would that's be just like... That's um, American. Yeah. That doesn't seem like a, a something that really needs its own term. 
<laughs> it's rare <laughs> enough. Uh, Limbo. Oh, Limbo's good. Hiatus. Kalani Harris from the prompt suggests the zero fucks period. <laughs> I don't know what that is either. When you give no fucks. Oh, okay. <laughs> presidential twilight or pre-inauguration. You know, if you need it, it's there and we don't have to use lame duck. But let's remember that the reason we go to all this effort of using language thoughtfully is that that way we don't make people feel bad or we don't further discrimination and we get our meaning across in a way that doesn't distract our audience with things that we don't mean. Can I give Bill one final honorable mention? Mm. Um, so this one comes by way of my partner, Aisha. Uh, she came across a, a, a bit of a, like a, I think it was like a Twitter feed with exactly this type of thing. Like I'm trying to remove like ableist slurs from my lexicon, but I really want to insult people still. How do I do that? <laughs> um, <laughs> and Bill, in, in opposition to the answer I gave you, before wanker which i think is like really versatile um i'm going to give you an incredibly specific and bespoke one that was on this twitter feed that aisha shared with me which was um you are as bad as an inescapable shower fart goodness and i just think that, that is possibly going to only ever be useful to you once in your life but in that one instance it's just going to be mm, chef kiss perfect yeah, you know how a lot of sentences are one-offs and never to be spoken again? Yeah. What's what's bad about a fart in the shower? Have you never farted in the shower and it I smells really bad? I frequently fart in the shower. It's my yeah, favorite place Yeah, but it smells really fart. bad and you are trapped <laughs> no. in that small cubicle with your fart? No, because when I sense a fart coming, I, I direct the water towards the area where the fart is about to come out. <laughs> this wow. is so not what I need to know. So very fart themed episode. This. You're the one... And also, I, look, all yeah. I can say is that I and other people in the world <laughs> are able to identify that being okay, in a shower right. with your own stinky fart is suboptimal life. Okay, what do you okay, think, Helen? Sure. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> well, I was just thinking, <laughs> yeah. if you if you want words that are a similar tier of swear to wanker, uh, there's pillock, uh, that means uh, penis, yeah. or bellend, which means the end of the penis. Ooh, now you are <laughs> bringing the connotation that the penis is bad there. Um, but I suppose yeah. there's a time and a place for penises, and out of those places, they aren't welcome, as the people that Bill is trying to describe may not be. Ah, very good. Yeah, that's a fair point. I had a good one. Um, I'm trying to stop saying tone deaf, and I thought of a good substitute. Mm. Off key. As a person who has been off key for his entire life, I find that personally offensive. Uh, okay, okay, <laughs> no, fine. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm just, I'm Sorry totally to the off key community. Yeah. Um, by the way, all of us, we need to work on crazy and insane. I've been doing the transcripts and it comes up a lot. Okay. Let's try bonkers, bananas, wild, and weird. Okay. That's okay. Fair. From Paul via email. Paul says, I love listening to Daniel with Russell on the 720 weekly segment. This is something else that I do on ABC Radio Australia. Uh, it's such an island of refuge in the bombastic ocean of morning radio show assaults on the ear hole. <clears throat> My question is... Why does the prefix amphi seem like a linguistic orphan? It makes an appearance in the words like amphitheater, amphibian, and seems related in meaning to ambidextrous, but after a couple of honorable mentions, amphi seems to run out of friends to headline with. What a great way to phrase that. I love it. It's so evocative. <laughs> it gets better. Um, with the generic meaning of both sides or all sides, I would have thought it could collaborate with greater frequency with other words to enrich their lives. For example... Amphivision, to see both sides. I'm amphivisual. Amphi-emotional, shortened to, hey, you're a bit amphi lately. Amphi-intelligent, well-rounded knowledge. So what's happened? Is it the case that Amphi didn't play well with others at the beginning of language construction? Did he show up like a bad-mannered Greek uncle uninvited to the Christmas lunch? Or did those uppity prefix also rans like Omni beat him out of everyday usage? Why is it sort of the same as ambidextrous? Do they share a common ancestor? Yes. Great show. Love your work. <laughs> Helen, Helen, in with the got? early answer. Yeah. Yes, let's all go home. <laughs> common ancestor, <laughs> done. Yeah, they are similar. <laughs> so it is actually in loads of words that have amb in, like ambulance, and uh, uh, loads that I didn't expect as well. Like, Ambulatory? Uh, is between. that also one? Uh, yeah, perambulate. All of those. Umlaut as well, apparently. What? Mm, what? So, you know, you, you're saying it doesn't appear in many places, but it's like put on a, a fake beard and popped up in loads of words. <laughs> You've just carried on with the great evocativeness. I love it. we got to break down ambi. All right. So the am is from, away from, 
and the B is both or both sides or from just all around. So an ambulance used to be a, a field hospital where you would walk around and check on everybody in the same way that embassy was an amb ambassador was somebody who goes around to all the different places. Oh. So then how do we get to amphi? Oh, amphi is just Greek and ambi is Latin. Oh, okay. So those are just the two Greek ones that showed up and Latin kind of did most of the heavy lifting. And also, as Helen said, put on like Groucho Marx glasses and just kind of hid in plain sight. Helen's absolutely right. It hides in plain sight. There are ambies everywhere, except it might just be the latter half. Because when we have bi, as in both, you know, uh. like bicycle, like two, that's that's the B in ambi. So oh, right. Amputate as well. Amputate. Yes, you're cutting around. Wow, so cool. So many places. So uh, yeah, the answer goodness. to the this question is, the... is that it's actually in lots of places? It's actually everywhere. Everywhere yeah. you're seeing a buy, that's actually ambi as well. Do you think Paul will be relieved or he'll be like, oh, it's ubiquitous, not cool anymore? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, he's got the hipster prefix like affection. And now that everyone's got it, he's like, oh, I'll move on to the next thing. <laughs> Let's move on to the next thing. I asked our <laughs> Discord friends, uh, did they have any questions for Helen? And there's one, of uh -oh. course, from Pharocat. Here Always. we go. <laughs> so we all know that etymologies that sound interesting are probably false, like the one for fuck, F-U-C-K. Yeah. What's the most interesting etymology you've come across that was actually true? Oh, yes. What's the surprisingly true folk etymology? Well, th if they're folk etymologies, then they're not true are they the fo folk sounding <laughs> etymology how's that yeah what's what, one where what's you the thing where you'd believe? be like that's a f that's folk as fuck oh. and it turns out to be not folk at all okay login i would say is one of these uh it's uh, it's a genuine log uh that was uh thrown overboard from a ship on a knotted rope uh, in order to measure speed so they would count out the the rate of knots another expression yep. and then log that in a book well, I mean, at the time they didn't log it. They wrote it in a book, and later we call that uh, logging it. Oh, logging well, because the book book. itself, the book, yeah, was the log book, right? Yes. So you would record things in the log book, and then you would log in. Yeah. Uh, oh and my now gosh. it's just log, like Captain's Log, start exactly. date two, three, yep. four point five. We've that encountered that is actually based on a real log, yeah. and I can't believe this, but That's I actually amazing. also knew that. <laughs> what? But you know how people are like, oh, podcast is a ridiculous word because no one uses iPods anymore. There's so many bits of detritus mm. in the English language. Yeah. Of things. People don't use a real log to log into a computer now. So I just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I just yeah, wish yeah, they'd exactly. uh, concentrate on other matters, really. I feel like there is yeah. a really good TikTok skit in that somewhere, like a person just holding an actual I'm log, going very to. delicately trying to type <laughs> into a keyboard with it. I found a good one. This one came up on the Speakeasy on ABC Radio last week. Why do we call it taking a gander? Oh, 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 oh. I want to guess. <sighs> yes. Um, because male geese are just fucking pricks and are in <laughs> everyone's business all the time. Yep, that's it. Is when it you... fuck off, really? <laughs> it's taking a gander. I mean, you know how geese, they have that neck and they're just always moving that neck around, looking around, having a good old sticky beak, oh. looking for whatever. So um, having a gander is one of them. Geese are such bullies. When I lived in the Netherlands, there were, there were streets when I walked down and there were geese on the road and I would like cross the road. Because like... Actual just... avatars of Satan. gangs of geese. Oh, 100%. Yeah. That's why it's they so are funny. awful creatures. Um, earlier today, a friend of mine said that they knew a dog that would like frequently attack geese and kill them by biting at their necks. Mm. And I was like, oh. what kind of a dog... What kind yeah. of brave What have you dog? got, a Tibetan Mastiff what? or something? Like, what like, is what that? What is that? Yep, Smurf. We said the same word at the same time. Yes. <laughs> Wait, okay, Smurf? Do you guys say you Smurf, say Smurf? Jinx? Yeah, wow. we say Smurf. What do you say? You say Jinx. Oh, Jinx. You can't say anything until I say your name. Okay. What? Well, shit. <laughs> uh, while Ben's recovering, uh, why is it called a tank top? Oh, I am actually wearing a tank top. Um, no, I'm wearing a crop top. Sorry. Uh, Everything's a crop top. I did a search for crop top and every conceivable shirt was in there. Yeah, I love crop tops. Uh, um, why is it called a tank top? Because mm. men who were in the uh, Ben maybe has an answer. Ben. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it's because tanks were hot as fuck and soldiers <laughs> had to wear like yeah. light shirts. Otherwise, it would just be horrendously I second this. Nope. Oh, fuck. fuck. What happened to their tank pants then? 
Maybe they didn't wear any, <laughs> just the tops. Yeah, well, look, I, I, I would be if you had told me that most personnel on board tanks in both World War One and World War Two were mostly naked, I would immediately believe you. <laughs> it's because you, Helen, your guess. Well, I've looked it up, so it wouldn't be fair. Okay, <laughs> it's because you wear it in a tank of water, swimming pool. Oh, like early Victorian swimming cozies kind of thing. Oh. Mm-hmm. I should say for the non-Australians, cosy is short for swimming costume. Sorry, mm. apologies. No, it's mm. fine. I just it's words that I've learned that I know that other people don't know. That's bathing suit for <laughs> Americans. Or swimsuit. <laughs> it's now coming back to our Twitter poll. Why is the raspberry sound not a speech sound in languages? The least common answer for our thirty one votes so far sounds taboo. Oh boo. Screw you guys. Twelve point nine percent. The next least popular answer, number two, saliva everywhere, twenty nine percent. And the most common answer from Laziness. our Twitter fans, too hard to make, fifty eight point one percent. See, yeah. lazy, lazy people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's I, hear it. Yeah, I identify as a lazy person, and I'm sort of vaguely proud of it. It means I just yep. I used a lot of effort to try and get work done in less time. <laughs> Smart way to live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Love it. Mm-hmm. We did have some other questions, but they were a little bit more involved, Bianca and Pharaoh Cat, so we wanted to do a good job on them. We'll be getting to those in a bit. Okay, thanks to everyone for their great questions. We got some comments to get through from Raya on Twitter. About our last episode, we did the word apartheid as it applies to the Palestinian situation. She says, great episode as usual. (laughs) I feel like I should chime in on the whole apartheid debate. We Palestinians call it apartheid. Oh, there we go. And during the show, I also looked up the Jewish Voice for Peace, which is uh, an American Jewish organization, which is uh, mostly pro-Palestine, and they also use apartheid. There we go. Raya continues, South Africans also refer to it as apartheid. Human Rights Watch calls it apartheid, and it is an apartheid system under international law. The term crime of apartheid originated in the South African context, but can definitely be applied elsewhere. Debating it only hurts the case, in my opinion. Peter, also on Patreon, says the points on apartheid were interesting, but in this case, it is a legal term in international law, so it has been defined already in a way abstract from the South African context. There we go. I was, look, as soon as Raya chimed in and was like, I'm a Palestinian, I'm like, yep, I believe you. I'm on board. And that's what I said at the time as well. Like, if Palestinian wants to say that, there is no way Whitey McWhiteson over here is going to be like, no, you shouldn't do that. Awesome. <laughs> From Joanna via email, hello at becauselanguage.com. Hello, everyone. I'm a relatively new listener and appreciator, also a speech therapist, among other things. Loved the episode about VP Kamala Harris's speech and terrific for hosting David Crystal, whose work I've met via Theatre Arts. Re the question in your latest episode about doubling of X in anti-vaxxer, etc. Daniel came close with the comment about how consonant spelling changes the preceding vowel. I just go a step further. Consider the alternative. If I were to read the word vaxer, single X, with no meaningful context, I'd probably pronounce it vaxer, rhyming with breakser. So to my eye, the double X confirms that the correct vowel is the shorter ah, as in vaccine. Thank you for the podcast tone of friendliness with just the right amount of brain tickling. What do you think, folks? Yeah, I like it. Would you mistake it for vaxer? I mean, um, we have a D in fridge for a similar reason, so I don't see why not. What do you call a person who waxes people's legs? Uh, Ooh. I mm. call her Carol, personally. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's fair enough. I mean, it's a Germanic thing to have a short vowel when you have two consonants after, so it makes sense. You it might is. need some guidance on that. Now, that said, English is famously, you know, not one to play well with the other Germanic children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah. you know, whatever. <laughs> Do you think people want the double X because vaccine has a double C? And so That's what just... I said. Oh. That was her big... Yeah, that was a good one. <sighs> Sorry, I, I like this guess. We should have her on more often. <laughs> <laughs> I agree at least when twice people agree so with me. At first I thought I would not see laxer and think lakeser, but then you know what? Maybe there is just something about double consonants that straightens it out for us and makes our brains go, change that vowel. I mean, it's not an incompatible explanation. Do you think it's also we don't often get to write a word with a double X in it, and so people are like, well, this seems fancy. <laughs> yeah, this is fun. It's a snazzy <laughs> it looks word. like there's a little dead person in the middle. It's sexy. Oh, God. Okay, I'm going to take that one back. Yeah. <laughs> Scruggy on Twitter says... Because Langpod have talked about the no languages of Australia. Remember them? Yes. 
the Aboriginal Australian languages that are quite similar to each other, and they distinguish them by saying, oh, those are the folks who say boon for no, and those are yeah. the people that say wan for no. Yeah. I immediately thought about the yes languages of France. Yes. Yes. What a fun and interesting way to name your language rather than naming it after a country or a group of people. I did not know about this. Did you, Helen or Hedvig? Yeah, Languedoc. Languedoc. Tell me more. Tell me more. Um, there were used to be a lot more diversity in French than there is now, and they used to refer to different varieties by the different words for yes. Most famous one is Languedoc, where uh, I think O C or something like that is the so Languedoc, Languedoc, I think it is. Uh, which was and- originally hoc in Latin, which is this. Yeah. Do you want a bagel? This. Yeah. Um, the, we, I think in that episode, we talked about some more cases as well, because there's a language in New Guinea where, um, if I'm correct in my memory, it's uh, the language names are the words for what. Mm. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a great, if you have like a shibboleth that people are aware of, it's a pretty neat way of distinguishing nearby varieties. Especially if they're really, really, really common aspects of the language, right? Like yes, no, or what. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's never like, you know, microphone or yeah. pizza. <laughs> <laughs> 47 <laughs> oh, they yeah. say 47 this way uh, thank you for that and then last of all from Bill on Twitter he says next EP you should vote to make bi-monthly align to the opposite configuration of bi-weekly and then he included the fire Elmo gif <laughs> so, <laughs> the fire Elmo gif is pretty great from now on bi-monthly means twice a month and bi-weekly means every Next two week. weeks Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Europe. Some people. Some people just want to watch the world burn. Clearly. <laughs> yeah. Helen Zaltzman, thank you so much for hanging out with us and being on this special episode. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. We should get you on way more often because you yeah, are super successful by virtue <laughs> of the fact that you're really, really, really smart and interesting and talented. No, I'm just good at sounding like I am. That is yeah, my yeah, one yeah. true gift in life. <laughs> to be fair. That is exactly the premise by which I have conducted nearly all of the successes in my life as well. So in this work. regard, I I um I really resonate with that. You should invite me onto your show where you just answer ransom questions. Ransom questions? Ransom, ransom questions. Ransom questions. How do I pay? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> make sure you make them jump in a pool first so they can get rid of any wire there. What kind of suitcase off. do I put the cash into? <laughs> <laughs> Sturdy. Hard shell. Definitely. Yeah, nice. Uh, how can people find out where you are or uh, get in touch with you online oh, if well, you want them to? You can find my podcasts, Answer Me This, The Allusionist with an A, and Veronica Mars Investigations in the pod places. And, I mean, you can probably figure out how to find me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook as well, if you so wish. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Helen, for being on the show. That was tons of fun. If you listen to the show and you uh, liked it and you have something to say to us, uh, if you listen to the show in the near future, it means you're a Patreon, so you can DM or ask us things on the Discord channel. But if you listen to this at a later date, you can always contact us through all of the other ways as well. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Mastodon, Patreon, TikTok, and Clubhouse, and on all of the places. We are Because Lang Pod, one word. Oh, and Substack. We're on Substack now too. Oh, and we have a new one as well that isn't mm-hmm. on my list. Daniel, please tell us. At this Substack, at this point, it's just claiming the name for everywhere. Okay. Mm. Uh, mm. Apparently, we've claimed staked out uh, our claim on Substack as well. You can ask us a question, comment, or if you just want to say hi. Um, and we would also love it if you uh, help the show by telling a friend about us or uh, leaving us a review in all the places we do reviews. Uh, and of course, I should mention, you can also send a good old-fashioned email at hello at And if you are as brave as Sam and Stories, feel free to tweet about us and recommend people on the tweeters um, to listen to us. That'd also be tons of fun. Uh, as Hedvig just alluded to, if you're listening to this uh, shortly after it's aired, you're probably already a patron, but we also drop our patron-only episodes much later on, so you might be listening to this ages away. This is the magic of podcasts from when we actually recorded this. Basically, I'm traveling through time right now and speaking <laughs> to a future version of you. How cool is that? And I'm basically saying to you, hey, if you wanted to be a patron of the show, one really, really cool thing that that does 
Um, like the, the vast majority of the money that we get from our patrons, we devote to transcribing our shows through the wonderful work of Maya Klein of Voicing Words, who we've actually had on the show. You can go and listen to the show with Maya Klein. That is a really good episode. You should definitely check it out. But um, yeah, the vast majority of the money um, we get at the moment goes towards transcribing the shows, which has the advantage of allowing people who are unable to listen to things to be able to enjoy our shows. But also it makes the shows searchable so if you are having that argument at the pub and the person's like "Mm -mm, this thing is definitely this way and you think to yourself fucking i remember daniel said a thing about this you can quickly jump on search it and you will actually be able to find that little that nugget it's like a shazam for interesting podcast (laughs) shit that's what we have basically created by transcribing our shows and that is only possible because of our patrons some of whom i'm gonna name right now thank you too Dustin, Termy, Chris B, Chris L, Matt, Whitney, Damien, Joanna, Helen, Bob, Jack, Kitty, Lord Mortis, Elias, Erica, Michael, Larry, Bin, Christopher, Andy, Mai, James, Nigel, Kate, Jen, Nazrin, River, Nikolai, Aisha, Moe, Steele, Andrew, Manu, James, Shane, Roger, Rianne, Jonathan, Colleen, Glyph, Ignacio, and Kevin. Thank you to all of our patrons. Our theme music has been written and performed by Drew Kroplyanov, who is a member of Ryan Bino and of the very great band Didion's Bible. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Don't let your dreams become memes. Because language. (laughs) That was so fucking cheesy. Oh my god. (laughs) Don't let your dreams become memes. memes. What the fuck? That sounds great. It resonated with me. I'm leaving. Okay, all right. (laughs) Don't let your dreams. Okay, okay. Okay, uh, boomer. Speaking of dad humor. Whatever you say. Mm. I have forgotten what? for the moment which one is older. <laughs> uh, Burnt is older. Did you just drop like a like a gavel? Are you like yeah. ruling on this? It was a oh, teaspoon. No. I had a cup of tea and I moved a teaspoon. I don't know why I'm so noisy today. I just touched a teaspoon. It really sounded like Daniel was Judge Judy and burned and burnt. I'm going to turn this gain down like mad. Okay, here we go. A super low gain. Let's go to Britta on Twitter. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, Hedvig, just community uh, callback right now. Go. Uh, 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 she, she's a Swedish dog. No, uh, damn it. Uh, I, I, I was expecting you to be like, oh, Britta, you're the worst. Oh, I was just, I thought I'd go a bit niche. Me or niche. Oh. Sorry, I went. I I, I forgot Britta is who canonically I was of, here. of Swedish descent on the show, Britta on the comedy show comedi- uh, community. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. One time, Pace's dad calls her a Swedish dog. I rolled too deep with a homie who was packing too sorry. much heat. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah, Britta on Twitter, you're the worst. There we go. Thank you. <laughs>